Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of our two part series entitled Asian Americans History, Memories and Social Justice. My name is Emily Williams. I'm the director of the Council on Aging and Senior Center right here in Bridgewater. Uh, we're joined um, by Wing Kai To, Assistant Provost for um, Global Studies. I'm going to get the title wrong, so you can introduce yourself as well, Wing Kai, uh, for Bridgewater State University. We also have Vernon Domingo and Sam Baumgarten from Bridgewater Communities for Civil Justice. This program was a collaborative effort to bring more awareness and education to all of the hate and all of the discrimination, as well as the history to the Asian American community here in Massachusetts in New England. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Emily. Uh, welcome everyone, all the friends from Bridgewater and from Boston and the other areas. Um, it, as Emily said, this is the part two of our series uh, about Asian American history and memories. Uh, in part one, uh, myself and also Professor Jean Wu, we talked about the um, history of Asian Americans and especially Chinese Americans in Massachusetts and talking about the immigration history of the last 150 years, uh, focusing on you know, changing uh, demographics um, of Chinese and other Asian American immigrants coming into this country and in our region, and also uh, focusing on the need to teach more about Asian American studies in our schools and in our curriculum. And today in part two, we're going to focus on personal histories and memories by three of the community activists and leaders um, in the Asian American and Chinese American community. And um, they will talk about their lives and their family histories on the one hand, and also talk about some of the social issues that are confronting um, the Asian American community. Um, especially we'll compare the perspectives of Chinatown and also the suburbs and especially in southeastern Massachusetts and to the South Coast region. Uh, we have three speakers today. Um, the first one is um, Stephanie Fan, and Stephanie, um, I've known Stephanie Fan for about 20 years, um, and I first met her uh, after I came to Massachusetts. I met her in the Chinese Historical Society of New England banquet, annual banquet uh, in 1998. And over the next few years, I was following what they did. And eventually I joined the board in 2004 and have been working with her for a long time and trying to learn about and study uh, Chinese American history. Um, and uh, Stephanie is a longtime Chinatown resident, multi-generation Chinese Americans. And she will talk about her family history and businesses in Chinatown and her life, lifelong uh, commitment to uh, the culture and education of Chinatown. And she was a public school teacher and a consultant and educator. And she's been active in bringing the Chinatown library back uh, because the Chinatown library was closed for a long time. And there was an effort to bring the Chinatown library back. And she was also very active in the historical society and many other organizations. Um, and the second speaker is Michael, Dr. Michael Liu. And Dr. Michael Liu um, kind of uh, also grew up in Chinatown, just like Stephanie. Um, and, but he had a very interesting career as well. And originally he was trained in science and engineering. So he had kind of a three, three careers, started with a science, as a science, science scientist, uh, getting his degree uh, in computer science and engineering uh, at both, um, you know, originally from Swarthmore College and then at Northeastern and also UMass Amherst. Um, and then he started to become more interested in engaging with the community and working in uh, Chinatown and help to find such organizations as the Asian American Resource Workshop, the Chinese Progressive Association, the Chinatown Housing and Land Development Task Force, the Asian American uh, the Asian Political Caucus, Asian American Political Agenda Coalition. Um, also involved in the coalition to protect Parcel C and the API movement. Um, as, as the executive director of Asian Americans Resource Workshop, he became very interested in the history of Chinatown 
and started to uh, go back to school and study a PhD in public policy and writing about Chinatown history. And eventually he published two books because of that. And, and he became the in, uh, research fellow of the Institute of Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. That's when I met Michael, again, almost 20 years ago when they started the Asian Americans in New England initiative uh, back in 2003. Um, Michael was uh, the, the author of editor of the book, The Slick Dance of Asian American Activism, Community Vision and Power. And he's the author of his new book, his almost two decade of research uh, about, about Chinatown uh, called Forever Struggle, Activism, Identity and Survival in Boston's Chinatown. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Shirley Mark. And Shirley is really um, very interesting family history because her grandfather, you'll hear about that, um, emigrated to, uh, was born in Nashville, Tennessee, I believe, but moved up to, um, to the South Coast and opened a restaurant in Fall River. And after they were born, um, after, you know, the grandfather, after the parents, um, on his, um, the father of Shirley, then opened up another restaurant in uh, Fairhaven you know, in 1960, and from 1960 to the 1990s, and they operated the restaurant. Um, and Shirley actually grew up, you know, in Fall River and Fairhaven, and um, spent her, her life, and then became very uh, active in the Chinatown organizations, and on anti-racist uh, university education, and she was involved in the uh, SJC commission, to study racial and ethnic bias in the courts. And she was active as a philanthropist uh, for, for uh, working for eight years. And over the last 15 years or more, and she has been working at Tufts University. She's the director of um, community partnerships at Tufts University. I'm sorry, the bios are very long, but hopefully <laughs> you get a, get a sense of what they did. So, um, Today, while they, each of them will speak for about 15 minutes, um, while they're talking, uh, please feel free to uh, put your comments onto the chat and talk about any of your questions or comments. Uh, we will not engage with your comments and questions at the same time, and we'll leave um, later on to discuss your comments and your questions. So let's start with Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wing Kai. Um, good evening, and thank you to um, everyone in the audience who's here tonight um, to learn more about the Asian American community. Um, again, my name is Stephanie, and I grew up in Boston's Chinatown. My dad emigrated to Boston in 1929. Uh, my mom's side of the family has actually been in the Boston area since the early 1900s. Um, and my mom and her six siblings, in fact, were all born in Boston. So my Boston roots go back well over a hundred years. And that's why it's so frustrating, so annoying, and so angering to hear folks tell me, go back where you came from. I'm, I'm from Boston, you know, I'm already here. Uh, the area in which Chinatown is located has long been a haven for immigrants. Uh, my classmates in elementary school were a mix of kids from uh, Greek, Syrian, Lebanese, Irish, and Chinese ancestry. Later, when I attended Girls Latin School, which is a prep school in Boston, I pretty much knew the ethnic background of most of my classmates, um, Polish, Scottish, Irish, Lithuanian, uh, Jewish, Italian, um, Black, very few Asian Americans at the time. Um, so within my school communities, I don't recall a whole lot of racist harassment or hatred. We were all aware of our immigrant roots and we were basically respectful of each other um, that we had, we, we were so close to our roots. We just didn't make fun of other people because of their immigrant roots. But as the first wave of immigrants began to succeed, they moved out of the city into the suburbs. A lot of the Greeks moved into West Roxbury. And if you drive around West Roxbury, you'll notice that there are a lot of Greek churches around Greek facilities. Um, the Chinese did not move out um, basically because the immigration laws were so discriminatory that it made it almost impossible 
for the Chinese who were here to bring their families over. And so if you're here by yourself as a, as a technically a single, ma uh, a single male, even though you're married, you have a family, uh, you're not gonna go buy a house in the suburbs and live there by yourself. So most of the Chinese stayed in the city as the city continued to grow around Chinatown. And that's why there is the Chinese community. Um, so um, within the Chinatown community, I was fine, but everyone was aware of how fragile our existence in the city of Boston was, especially because we could be so easily targeted just because of the way we look. Mm -hmm. And because um, very many residents were dependent on having a clean immigration record um, in order to be able to sponsor uh, family members to come over. I mean, it was a, uh, even though the, uh, the United States, um, you know, eventually did away with the Exclusion Act, what they did was impose um, a, a quota of the number of people mm -hmm. of Chinese ancestry who could come. It wasn't the number of Chinese from China. It was Chinese, whether you were born in England or not, if you were ethnic Chinese, you were in that quota. And the quota for the whole country was 105 people per year. So it was very, very difficult. And you know, a slip up in your immigration status or somebody giving you a hard time, giving you, you did something that, you know, that, that was it. Your chances of being able to bring your family over um, just got diminished. So um, the attitude of white Americans pretty much depended on the United States relations with China, as well as some media hyped um, incidents that were essentially blown out of proportion. Uh, to encompass our whole community. So I'll give you some examples of that. As a child, I attended a Christian Sunday school. Most families did not have enough income to fully support the church or enough of a history with that church, um, but the church didn't really need our financial support. As long as the minister could go out into the suburbs, to the suburban congregations, and they could rake in sympathy dollars to save the poor heathen Chinese. Um, he says, okay, okay well, you know, we're gonna go to, and we, and we were, as children, we were recruited to um, do performances, a sort of a, you know, pony <laughs> dance show. It says, okay, yeah, these poor Chinese in Chinatown, we gotta help them. And we have to save them um, and convert them to Christianity. Uh, so it was a very patronizing relationship. And um, even though the minister didn't, you know, they, I mean, there were people within the church and within uh, the activities that we held at the church that were good people, but the overall reason for doing it was in some ways very patronizing. And my parents knew that, so my parents didn't go, but they sent me and my siblings to church every, every Sunday. And, uh, you know, so you, you, that's the kind of relationship that I had with the church. Um, <clears throat> another uh, example is a carryover of negative stereotypes from the exclusion period, um, particularly when it came to food. So there were things like, oh, they eat rats, they eat cats. And so there's a restaurant in Chinatown called Cafe House. And there was a day that the, the H uh, in the word cafe went out and so it said cat house and then that was the rumor oh they eat cats in chinatown um, and these kinds of events this kind of of um shouting by the by the the press just made it so difficult for our restaurants to really do well and you know threatened our livelihoods um, but more seriously the relationship between the united states and china that had major repercussions for us uh, as um, people of Chinese ancestry. After the Second World War, um, during which China and the United States were allies, uh, China's own civil war continued and eventually led to the ouster of the nationalist government um, to Taiwan. But the most dreaded word in America in those days was communism, communism. This was like the start of the McCarthy era. And I, rem I particularly remember seeing a news magazine with a map of, China, of Asia on the cover and China was painted red. 
and you could and the red was dripping on down to Southeast Asia. And it was clear what the message was. You know, if we don't stop China, communism is going to spread to Southeast Asia and to the world. Um, and so that had a big impact um, on the Chinese community. Uh, you know, they were, we, we knew the government was collecting names. I mean, a lot of people, uh, for example, you know, my father, he, whatever money he earned, um, he used it very sparingly, but he also sent a big chunk um, as a re remittance to support his family in China. Well, mm. the United States kept track of the money that was going back. There was no hiding this. Um, so it was it was a very scary time. Uh, let's see. Um, this is also, they, they couldn't speak out. You could not say China has beautiful lakes without people accusing you of being a commie. Uh, what they said was, you're a commie, you're a commie. You know, go back, go back to where you came from. Um, there, there was just a lot of fear during the McCarthy era. Uh, a, similar, a similar situation, of, of course, had beset the Japanese Americans during the Second World War. I was too young at the time to really understand what had happened to the Japanese Americans, but I am sure that my parents, my grandparents, and all those in the community knew what happened to the Japanese American, and they knew that this could very well happen to Chinese Americans, that we could all be sent to an internment camp. Um, so people were told, you know, kids who were growing up, you know, just be quiet, don't say anything, don't cause a fuss, don't bring attention to yourself. Um, just study hot. So um, then, of course, there was the Vietnam War, and that's by then, by the time of the Vietnam War, I was an adult. I was following current events um, on my own and um, could see it all live on television um, in living color. And it was, to me, it was just horrifying to see the killing of people, uh, many of whom were just innocent women and children um, in Southeast Asia. And these were people who looked like me. Um, and it was infuriating to hear soldiers talk about destroying a village to save it. So and what created this kind of mindset that people could go and do this and not feel like there were any repercussions, that this was a normal thing to do? Because they're not human beings. You can do it, just go ahead, burn down the village. Um, I had a Japanese American friend who was very active in the anti-war movement at the time. And um, he, told me one day when we were at a, at a meeting that he felt he was being followed by the FBI because he would go down the stairs in one of the T-stops and come back right back up and the guy would be following him. Eventually, I think they must have caught up with him in some way or other, but he was recruited to do some debriefing of um, returning veterans from Vietnam. And he said that he would walk into a room filled with returning vets and he would ask them, he said, what's the first thing that crossed your mind when I walked into the room? And remember, this is a Japanese American, not Vietnamese American. And the response was, it's a gook, let's kill him. So this is the mindset of people who were coming back from Vietnam. As a female, as a young female, um, I had um, a different kind of experience that was equally bad. I was doing a lot of work in the community and I had set up my own phone line um, to handle the calls that were related to my work without having to use my parents' phone line and bothering them. And every Friday and Saturday night, I would get phone calls from some of these Vietnam vets. They would just look up my name in the phone book, look in the, oh, Wong, that's, you know, S Wong, that, that sounds like, oh, that might be Susie Wong. You know, I would get these calls and they would, of course, want to go out and have a good time. And I would say, no. And they would start swearing. He says, you know, I effed your mom in Vietnam. I effed your sisters. Who are you telling me that you are not going to go out? And of course, I would slam the phone down. Um, but it was scary. I could not walk around Boston Common. I could not go to Riviera Beach without being approached. So um, that was, you know, that just had a big impact on me. Um, as I watched and heard Asian Americans, particularly on the West Coast, um, begin to get organized and begin to fight back um, for 
four rights, uh, we were, um, of course, closely following the um, Black civil rights movement and the Black power movement. And we said, well, you know, we have very similar issues. And so um, many of us on the, on the East Coast, because we're a little bit, you know, probably a generation behind the ones on the West Coast, so I felt like, well, we need to have a movement here on the, on the East Coast as well. And that was when I became um, you know, active in the community. And uh, I, I think that with my parents' generation, with my grandparents' generation, uh, they did not feel comfortable speaking out as I had talked about earlier. But for our generation, I and mean, we're second, third generation, we're citizens, we're getting educated and we're saying, no, we're not gonna take this quietly anymore. And I know that there were some parents who told their kids, you know, no, just be quiet, just stay out of trouble. My parents, thankfully, were not um, among them. They didn't come and broadcast what I was doing, but they just, um, hi, John. Um, they were, they were, um, they were, I think, secretly pleased that I was doing what I was doing, um, and that was when I became very involved. Um, and I, you know, I, I do want to mention uh, a, a movie that I watched in the 70s. It was a Bruce Lee movie and the very first Bruce Lee movie that I had seen. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Chinese Connection, but there's a scene in, in Chinese Connection where Bruce Lee's character is in Shanghai and he comes to a park and the park has a sign that says no dogs and Chinese allowed in the park. Now this is in China. This is not like in some other country. And Bruce Lee character gets so mad that he, in one of his, you know, his signature moves, he jumps up with and with his feet, he kicks down the sign. And I saw this movie in a theater in Chinatown because um, the DVDs were just beginning to come out, or actually, um, videotapes were just beginning to come out. And a chair went up in the audience. I mean, it was just like such a relief. Yes, that's exactly how we feel. You know, that it was a, an oppressive feeling. Even if you didn't encounter um, individual cases of harassment, there was this just overall feeling of harassment. And it turns out that a lot of um, African-Americans who watched this movie and watch Bruce Lee movies they actually felt the same way seeing that scene. But to me, that was amazing. You know, and I, as a teacher, I, I had to go to um, a summer school and do a, a survey of, uh, of health education needs. And most of my, the students that were, that I was surveying were, <laughs> were African-American and they, they kept calling, they said, you know, do you know how to do Kung Fu? Do you know Angela Mao, who was a very famous Chinese actress? And I says, no, but we can talk about that again <laughs> after you finish the survey. So <laughs> that was pretty neat. Um, so now, uh, so that concludes my remarks, except for one thing that I want to say before I turn the mic over to Mike, um, and that is to offer some advice. Many years ago, when I was on a cruise ship and I was in the lounge um, at a table, we were all waiting to uh, disembark on, on one of the, the tours. And um, I was sitting across from a white gentleman and he said to me, where are you from? And I said, well, he said, what? No, he said, what are you? And I said, I'm an American. He said, no, 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 really, what are you? And I was like, I'm an American. And, uh, and, you know, eventually we got to what he was looking for. But it's a question that still comes up frequently because the assumption is still that we don't belong here. So like, where are you from? And a lot of, I know that a, a lot of the younger generation consider this like, you know, a microaggression or a huge aggression. Um, but I, I, I see it a little differently. I see it more as um, a kind of ignorance and um, based on these wrong assumptions. And so my advice to you is, if, you're gonna, if you want to know what somebody's ethnicity is, just ask them, what is, your background and just assume that the Asian Americans that you meet here are American citizens, then we all belong here. Um, and you should, after you know, you learn that, okay, I'm Chinese American, that you should also be willing to share your own heritage. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, to me, I'm always kind of surprised 
that when I throw this question back to, to a person, I said, well, what are you? Where are you from? Where are your ancestors from? They say, um, I don't really know. I've never mm -hmm. talked to my parents about this. So I think we need to do that. We need to ask everybody, if you're gonna ask me, ask everybody else, you know, what's your ethnic background? What is your ancestral background? How did you come here? And what kinds of obstacles did your parents, grandparents, great grandparents meet, you know, face when they arrived here? And I think this would go a long way to reinforcing the fact that we are a country of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And aside from the indigenous people and from those who were brought here against their will, we are in an immigrant community. And unless we reinforce this and emphasize this, there's always going to be this other, you know, you're the other because you just look different. Um, mm -hmm. so that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Michael? Okay. Um, I actually thought that um, <laughs> instead of telling a usual oral history, I, I, I think I'll just tell us, uh, give you all a story of uh, a series of vignettes uh, from my life to, to give you an idea. Because I felt like in my, what I had to say, my overlap a lot with um, what Stephanie would talk about. Um, so anyway, um, uh, similar to, to, yeah, Stephanie, my family here in the United States um, have been here for several generations uh, that um, my, um, I, had, I had relatives supposedly that, I mean, um, direct relatives that worked on the building of Trans Transcontinental Railroad, mm -hmm. you know, which means that, you know, we were here for, um, you know, at least 150 years, but we were we were the uh, first American-born generation, and that's the result of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so, um, growing up in Chinatown, I so you know my my mom was a um, war bride, so that was she was part as you know Stephanie described. There was a, a even after World War II. You know, that low quota made it difficult for Chinese to Im immigrate. But if, but my father was a veteran. So if you were a veteran, uh, you know, you could bring a bride back to the United States. So that's what a lot of Chinese American soldiers did. So, um, and that's when the first large number of, I think, uh, women started relatively large number of women started coming into Chinatown is through this, this war bride ex exemption. Uh, so we, you know, we lived uh, in a row house in that time, at that time, Chinatown was all these brick row houses. Uh, just an example of what it was like. Um, we, we had, we lived in a, in, in a apartment, only one room had heat. Um, I, you know, and, and we had hot water, which I, I understood later was actually considered sort of a luxury. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I slept in a bed with my uh, younger brother and sister. Um, and uh, I went to, you know, I think like Stephanie, I went to the, uh, the old Quincy school, which at that time was the oldest public school in the country. And uh, it was a place where uh, the, primarily Irish American teachers sometimes would call Chinese students by number because they had difficulty saying mm. their name. So uh, it was a poor community, but I think it was close knit. And, you know, we didn't necessarily feel particularly poor. Um, I mean, we knew we were poor, but I mean, I, people, you know, it, I think uh, people who grew up at that time actually still look back on it fondly. Um, and so, but it was a poor community. There was no recreational space. There was, there were no services except for um, the churches uh, would provide some, and, and also some of the traditional association with private, very limited services to the community. And so, uh, and so being what it was, you know, the when after World War II, when the interstate highway system 
was built and when urban renewal plan uh, schemes were developed, you know, those, those, those uh, plans targeted uh, low income, um, poor neighborhoods. So, um, you know, I understand in African-American community, sometimes refer to urban renewal plans as uh, Negro removal. Uh, and you know, so that so Chinatown was targeted. Uh, both both the highways we have I ninety three and I ninety going to Chinatown that took out a lot of housing. And I re <clears throat> and I remember um, you know playing in the rubble of a lot of homes of my friends that that were built. So, um, but we you know we moved from our initial uh, house on Tyler Street. We also lived on Wash, uh, Washington, corner of Washington and Warren Street. Um, and uh, before, I think around the age of 12, um, my family moved out to, to Brookline. Uh, the, my, my grandfather on my mother, mother's side uh, had done very well running a restaurant in New York City. So she borrowed money or she got money from him to be able to afford to, to move to a place in Brookline. Uh, Brookline wasn't as, as exclusive as it is today, but it was still difficult for, for Chinese to move out there. Um, and you know, and people wanted to live near the, um, the subway lines because my mom was still a garment worker. All the women worked in garment. Um, all, and, and my father was, was a restaurant worker. And almost all the men worked in the restaurants, or all, all the laundries. Uh, so they had to be near the the, the subways to, to get into get into Chinatown. So, um, and I think similar to what uh, so growing up in, in Brooklyn and later in college um, was really a cultural and class shock to me, and what I went through. Um, but and I'm just going to skip over this part because I, I want to talk more about some of the, the work with, that we did later. But basically, you know, I mean, I had friends, but I think like both in, in Brookline and college, I was never, um, I would say, uh, I never felt fully accepted. I, I remember I was, be, I was shocked one day, I, I was talking to friends and Brookline Public School, and one of them was talking about their family flying to Europe to go skiing. The whole idea about <laughs> taking a vacation by flying to a foreign country, and the idea about skiing was like totally beyond what I could imagine. <clears throat> but anyway, so but through this process, um, you know, as Stephanie mentioned, I I I, um, I was affected also by the the civil rights and Black Power movement. And the war in Vietnam um, in in college, you know, I witnessed um, you know black students students for ethnic studies. We had the uh, national student strike after the you know Cambodia was bombed. Um, so um, you know, so it was a very the times you know really affected me uh, because I really didn't. There was no teacher. I, like most, a lot of students sometimes are influenced by, by the professors or so on, but that's not what happened. It was just like the in, environment and the times. Um, but another thing that, that, that really affected me was that, um, was that uh, it's not simply that I saw these things happening, but, but my, my brother who, who went, who got into Columbia had, and was younger than I, a year younger, had in the process of becoming active, he was part of a group that occupied the president's office, the Columbia president's office about the war. And after that, he dropped out and um, went to do community organizing with a group of other, other people um, uh, in New York Chinatown. And so, and they created a group that was very similar and maybe probably modeled, partially modeled after the Black, the Black Panther Party. Party. And so, um, and that kind of, you know, appealed to me because 
you know, it's a group of people trying to do some ide idealistic things. And um, so that really, you know, affected me. Um, you know, they, they did things like initial things where they did things like, um, you know, uh, try to open the gym uh, in New York Chinatown. They did health screenings for TB, you know, door to door and that sort of thing. But they're also very political, uh, like the Black Panther Party. They, they demonstrate against tourist buses coming to Chinatown and so, and so on. Um, so I, I just want, so after, after I left, after I left college, I, as Wen Kai mentioned, uh, my first my first bout of college, I did go into the community. I, I went into the one of the um, service or, the new service organizations was being that was being formed. It was an elderly center, um, and and you know as I mentioned, there was very few services, but but a lot of American born began uh, forming service groups as well as you know. Uh, activist groups, um, like there were volunteer groups that that taught English, or, or they did health screening or private translation. There were others, I think, that were more slightly older group that that tried to get funding and and actually created the basis for a lot of the um, social service organizations that that exist in Chinatown today. Um, but a couple of things I just want to uh, describe in terms of as I got active uh, to give you an idea what it was like was that I was part of um, the first public demonstration in Chinatown against um, Tufts and Lincoln Medical Center because part of the urban renewal plan that the, the city of Boston supported was that um, a plan that for uh, New England Medical Center to take over all of residential Chinatown. Uh, that was the initial plan. It, it later became somewhat modified because of protests, but all, all throughout the city, in fact, uh, about urban renewal. Um, but I was part of this demonstration, uh, you know, but, but Tufts was expanding. I mean, Tufts New England Medical Center was expanding. And I was part of this demonstration. And one of the things on our list of demands was for them to provide translation so that they could service the neighborhood in which they were situated. Um, but so this this was you know we did we were very young we didn't know what we were doing and and you know the demand was denied and we never got it implemented. But it just indicate indicated. Um, and this, you know, this is actually part of the report that they themselves wrote was that the, the hospital did not, New England Medical Center did not see serving the community. Uh, that was not part of their thing. I remember they had had reading about, they had a, at the same time, they had a pilot program uh, to service, you know, poor people in Mississippi, but they didn't want to service the Chinatown uh, neighborhood. So I think in a lot, it kind of indicated how I think a lot of institutions looked at Chinatown and they just kind of overlooked them. So another example I think was the, um, was the, that I got involved in was the, the busing con uh, crisis in the city of Boston when, in the 1970s. So in, so in the uh, implementation of the busing program, um, the plan was primarily directed at black and white families and students. So for Chinese and, and Latin X families, it was, there was no, no guidance. Um, and so, uh, so when the, these parents, as, well, when the parents, particularly for the elementary school students, got notices that their children were supposed to be bused uh, into white areas, they were very concerned because the previous year they had seen when the older students had gone, there had been a lot of violence, but there was 
no provisions for any teachers, monitors, or anything to protect these students. So, um, so, so we helped um, these parents organize so that their children could be safe, and that they, you know, they all they wanted was that there be some monitors that 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 communications would be translated, um, and that there'd be sufficient staff that, that they knew that they would, their children would be, be looked after. Mm. So, so they had to organize uh, a boycott of schools that was actually very effective. And, and not actually the Department of Justice got involved and they, they held on to this boycott until the demands were met. But it just indicated again, institutions just kind of overlooked the, the Chinese community. Um, I see I'm running running end of time. Let me just say that, let me just kind of end by saying that one of the most uh, gratifying things that I did was um, work on as work on the uh, the campaign to elect Mel King as mayor of Boston. He was this is 1983, and um, and he became the first uh, black candidate to reach the finals. It was a total surprise. Um, it was related related to the fact that urban renewal renewal too, and the neighborhoods were being um, well. All the development and all the folks was was happening downtown, and nothing was do was done to benefit the neighborhoods. But Mel led this coalition that was made up of many constituencies, many neighborhoods. He was raising the, the issue of um, LGBTQ people, women at a time when, you know, this was not as widely embraced as it is today. And so I was part of a group in Chinatown that for the first time got involved, for us, the first time got involved in, in electoral politics. And, and what was unusual is that we felt part of, um, accepted part of the rest of the city, which was represented by all these other groups. And so it became what was known as the, you know, the Rainbow Coalition. And it was, a, it was a, also a term that actually later that Jesse Jackson picked up for his national run for president. Um, what you know, right, the term Rainbow Coalition. But to me, it was a it was a, a peek into what was possible, uh, you know, in the city where, you know, we could, you know, the Chinatown, Chinese people could be, could be, you know, acknowledged and, and represented. Um, so I know I'm going over, so I'll just stop there. Um, Okay, Michael, we can follow up a little bit later, you know, with the later histories. Um, Shirley? Okay. Hi, Wing Kai, and um, thank you everyone for having me here tonight. I was really pleased to be um, invited, and I really love the way this event was framed, history, memories, and social justice, because I feel that in my circles, we often talk about history and we also talk about social justice, but we seldom connect our personal stories to that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, you know, sneak it in a little bit, but this is, um, I think it's just really interesting the way you framed it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do my best not to, not to be too long-winded, but I do have a long history to share with you. So um, apologies in advance. Um, similar to Stephanie and Michael, my family has been here for over a hundred years. We have direct documentation that my grandfather arrived in 1916 by himself. And what's really interesting, we can't figure it out because my father was not born yet and no one who was alive at that time is alive now. You know, we lost a lot of people over, you know, over the years, of course. Um, so we just have a lot of, we, we're just going through all kinds of records to try to figure out who was where, when. 
And what I wanted to share with you was um, just like this first part that I'm going to talk about is the history from 1916 to 1950. So I think people who know American history know that that you know, basically in the 1920s, it was the depression in this country, you know, in the 20s into the 30s. My grandfather came in 1916, somehow he left again, and then he came back in 1921. When he came back in 1921, he has my grandmother and two of my older uncles with him. There's four of them that arrived. From 1923 until 1929, over seven years in the 20s, there are six children born. Imagine that. If you're a parent, if you're a woman, imagine six children in seven years. Mm. Two were born in Fall River. Two were born in Providence. My father was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. And my uncle was born in Birmingham. Mm. In 1929, don't ask me how that happened. They have a newborn and it's the depression. And we just speculate that they could not make a living. So somehow they all went back to China just in time for Japanese occupation in China. So for the thirties, they're in China, they're moving around a lot. They're moving between Southern China and Nanjing. You know, they're, they're in the village as well as in cities and they have all these children and they're just trying to make it. We didn't know until about 15 years ago that my father and his brother were put in an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage in Macau during World War II. And we think, well, we know it's because the parents couldn't really take care of them. They needed them to be in a safe place and they put them there for five years. And then after the war, my grandfather went and picked them up. So then my father comes back to, I'm going to focus on my father now moving forward for the next few decades um, because I don't know all my uncles and aunts trajectories. They were all over the place. But my father ends up coming back to the US in the late 40s. He's a young adult at that point. And, oh, I forgot to mention, the first restaurant that my grandfather opened was in 1931. We found official records of that in Fall River on South Main Street in Fall River. And over the next two decades, different ones of my uncles ran the restaurant. I think it's just these little tiny mom and pop restaurants and whoever's around runs it. So my father ends up getting the restaurant around 1950 and then he joins the US Army a year later because it was the Korean War and he was drafted um, because he was a US citizen, he was born here. Um, he doesn't actually get sent to Korea because of a health issue, and um, he just served in the army and was really proud of his service. I guess the other thing I want to mention is that his older brothers all served in the U.S. Army in Europe um, during World War II. So I have like four uncles, I think, that all served in Europe. That's something that people don't really talk about. You know, when you talk about Asian American history, people don't talk about the people who served and the families who have been here as long as our families have. And I know all my uncles were really proud of their service as well. Um, and I, I'm just skipping because we're talking about like how many years of history. In 1960, um, at that point, you know, I'm born, you know, few of my siblings are born um, in Fall River and we moved to the New Bedford area. And my father opens a restaurant in Fairhaven called Wame Restaurant. Anybody who, who goes by that area, my cousin runs that restaurant now. My uncle ended up taking it over after my father, my, an uncle on my mother's side took it over um, because they were all younger. And then my cousin took it over about 10 years ago or so. 
But in the 1960s, you know, my formative years, 60s through the, you know, 70s, you know, as Michael said, and I think Stephanie as well, you know, that was the Vietnam War. New Bedford is a very, you know, was, there was a lot going on in New Bedford. You know, I was just a young child, but, um, you know, we were basically one of a few dozen Chinese families at that time. There really weren't other Asian families at that time. Everybody was Chinese. Mm -hmm. And everyone ran either little tiny mom and pop Chinese restaurants or they ran laundromats, but there really were only a few laundromats. The restaurants were, um, you know, really the only um, job employment opportunity that people had, you know, at that time in these little towns and small cities. Um, so I don't wanna go over what happened in the 60s. I think people know what happened in the 60s in this country. Um, you know, I think for us, because I, I come from a really large family, all my uncles ended up having restaurants of their own. And that was basically our community. And all the other Chinese families we knew had restaurants or laundries. And so on their only day off, we would um, rotate and have meals at each other's restaurants. You know, they would cook for like 50 people and, you know, the family would get together and friends. And I think that was most um, impressionable for me is that the family was our community because we weren't in any mainstream community. You know, we didn't belong to um, a faith community. Mm. Although like Stephanie, they did send us to Sunday school, but our parents didn't go. So <laughs> it wasn't firmly rooted. Um, and I think that what I saw was that we had to support each other because society was not there to support us, if you will. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that until, you know, much later when, um, you know, after I went to college. You know, for myself, you know, I think people talked about this, but everyone struggled financially. Nobody was wealthy. Nobody in my town was wealthy. Everybody was a fisherman or their parents worked in factories. Um, that area, even today, I mean, now the town I grew up in Fairhaven is very middle-class and it's a beautiful little suburban town, you could say. When I was growing up, most people worked in fishing and factories. And um, most people were immigrants, although they were mostly white immigrants from um, Ireland, Portugal, Cape Verde, Norway. Um, those were like the big immigrant groups there. And, um, you know, that's kind of like the profile of the community, if you will. So for myself, I was tracked into voc ed when I was um, in middle school mm. because I wasn't a good student and I couldn't do math. And it's hard to believe, but they really did say to me, why can't you do math? You're Chinese mm -hmm. or your brother is good at math. Why can't you do math? And I was just like, <laughs> I'm like 12 years old, you know? So anyways, I was not a traditional learner and I went into voc ed and it wasn't until I was um, four years out of college, uh, out of high school that um, a college professor asked me why I wasn't in college. And I said, well, I flunked the SATs and I can't do math. Um, and I was in voc ed, I'm never gonna go to college. And he said, oh, there's a college that I know that's right for you. And he told me about Hampshire College. So I don't know if people know about Hampshire College. It's a very alternative, tiny, hippie school, you know, and they accepted me. It was a miracle. And then, of course, my life changed. I guess what I want to say about how my, my upbringing and my family history and my education, I'll say, has influenced my work, which has been centered around racial justice for um, pretty much all my life. And that is that when I was able to go to Hampshire College, I did learn about um, Asian American history. I took a course at UMass Amherst and it opened my eyes, it validated my personal experience. It put my personal experience in the context of US history so it's like things started to 
come together. You know, the puzzle pieces started coming together. And from there, I just, you know, pursued my own studies and got involved with Boston's Chinatown community and with a Pan-Asian um, focus. I've done a lot of work. Um, well, I never know how to say this because I am Asian American, but I do identify very closely with um, the African American community and have worked on lots of anti-racism um, anti things, issues. So this past year has been especially painful and also um, hopeful, if you will, because the younger generation and the broader white community nationally has started to open their eyes and to see what's been happening for hundreds of years that people did not realize before. Mm -hmm. um, I know my time is up. So I guess what I'll close with is, um, you know, I have, I didn't know what I wanted to do after college because as a first gen student, as a child of immigrants, if you will, because my parents do represent the immigrant community, even though um, they were, my dad was born here. You know, I didn't have any mentorship and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just, started working for um, any place that would take me, but it was always centered on some social issue, if you will. And um, I've been very, very fortunate, have had a very rich um, professional life that's been very meaningful. And um, I'm just really happy to be here and to share my story with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you all, all three of you for sharing your family histories and uh, your personal memories and how the, your life connected with some of the uh -huh. major, major trends um, in our region and about uh, our work. Um, I like to open this up to the audience and see if folks have any thoughts and reflections on the role of Asians and Asian Americans in, in, our, in our lives. Gloria? <laughs> well, I like Jeannie Foster. I, ne I did not have any Asian Americans in my classes uh, a long, long, long time ago in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. But I did live in a community where we had many other cultures, but none uh, where there were no Shirley's, there were no, you know, there were no, no Michael's. Uh, no Stephanie's, but one of the things I did find after I had gone off to college a second and third time, um, and I had to teach history, I did talk to my students about the Chinese Americans who worked on the transcontinental railroad. And that was a big deal for them because they always thought that, no, that wasn't so. And, you know, then we had to look into the um, into the history books and show them. And when I was with you folks the last time, one of the things I did show you was that now the Bridgewater Rainier Regional School District is doing Asian studies um, in the seventh grade with the students. And I'm just so happy to see that because um, there's too many stereotypes going around with Asian Americans as they are with uh, people of, who are African American and the native people, the uh, Indians who are in this country. And I wanna thank all of your guests here tonight. Um, and thank you very much for sharing because I tell you, I, there were things that I learned that I didn't know before. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria. I'd like to share, uh, my name is Jean Foster. Um, I'm really, uh, it was really important to me to listen to these stories today because um, I, as a teacher in Boston Public Schools for 30 years, um, I found that it, depending on where you, you taught, uh, the Asian population could be very, very few 
or maybe is you know you'd have a whole class of bilingual children in a couple of grades and they would transfer they would be um bilingual from like first grade to second grade and by third grade they'd start to be integrated into the regular curriculum the regular classrooms um the the part of boston in particular was the holland school which is on geneva avenue in boston and i remember empathizing with the students who were in those two classes of, of uh, Asian bilingual classes because they, the other cultures far outnumbered them. They were as isolated as I remember being when I first came to Bridgewater State College back then in the 70s. Um, and that, that experience made me really um, try to support those young people be, w when they were at lunchtime or when they were at the playground. Um, it's the same cycle of bullies that are always looking for somebody to pick on and whoever the smaller group of students are becomes the target. And um, I fortunately wasn't one, a target because I had a couple of cousins that walked with me pretty much everywhere and they were very tough from the Bronx. And they, you know, in New Bedford, we grew up in New Bedford and uh, they came to, to New Bedford to live. So that I had bodyguards, so to speak, helping me. Um, and I realized it because people would say things, but they would, uh, you know, to me, to, you know, the teasing words, the name calling words, they, they were very ginger about it because uh, of my bodyguard cousins. But I, I saw that there was a need for, as you were saying, I, I'm thinking of the bus, the bus incident where you had children busing in the, in those, in the sixties, you did, you really did need to have someone uh, of your culture who spoke your language to be on those buses with the children. And similar, uh, we felt the same way as people of color. And I'm cave, my, my background is I have three cultures that I celebrate. Um, I'm Cape Verdean, African American, and Native American. So I you get it in three, I've gotten it in three different ways. But I do say that there was a um a great advantage to living in cultural neighborhoods where you know you had people of your culture to to turn to, to speak with, to celebrate your, your language, your culture, the music, the foods, all of that is what I grew up in the Cape Verdean community of New Bedford uh, realizing. So um, I think that even though Boston may not have realized or cities, big cities may not realize, um, there is an advantage to doing that because then not, you get to, to still celebrate who you are. Um, and um, I really, one of the things that, that was really a sad experience, I think for some of you, I heard you talking about the internment camp or something that was happening during the Korean War or the one of the World War II. Um, we were very small, but you know, those are stories that they tell in the history books. I don't think, any of our history was in the history books um, growing up as I, as I testified before in my time of doing the um, panel discussion about African-Americans, there were no heroes. It was totally a European story of, his, of history. It was all about the Europeans who'd come in, the, co the colonial people, the Puritans, the people, the leaders who were, you know, it was never about other cultures uh, uh, of color, and that including Asian, Latino, Hispanic. Our heroes were never in those history books, and we didn't I, like you. I didn't learn about them until I got to college. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard about Martin Luther King. That was really it. <laughs> I heard about maybe uh, Frederick Douglass somewhere along because he lived in New Bedford, so we knew about Frederick Douglass. We even have the house that he lived in is um, a landmark now today. Right. So, I mean, you have to 
do that within your your own people have to do to tell you the stories and tell you who's you know who do you need to remember in life and who did what and 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 help you to know that every culture in this country has has something to be proud of absolutely and who they are mm-hmm. and i think that um because i got none of that from school as a teacher i became a multicultural teacher i knew i was teaching right. black history and if i taught black history i may as well teach some other histories because i didn't want anybody telling me no so i ended up doing a cultural survey uh especially when i was in my music years because i wanted to represent the cultures not just who's famous but the music and then each person each classroom became a country of a region of the world so asia was one of my regions easter eastern asia and then they all learned a song in that country's language and in english and they all had to do research on the people and the places and the foods and the culture these and um that was the only way i could help it was a it's been a journey of making sure that everyone knows about others cuz really i think it comes from ignorance the lack of knowing that there are heroes in every culture it really comes from that base um roslindale was my last community to teach in and i was amazed at the not it's like a united nations and that there was so when we did east asian countries and the survey came back in one of my schools at at least four different countries from asia so i uh, five different i had enough for, i had enough seven was one year one year because i did an annual survey to see and um it amazed me uh even the songs how different the languages sounded and you know so it's really about education what can we do to mandate that cultural education becomes a core part of the curriculum um in across the country that's that's really the answer because it starts young you you're training the minds of young people to be open and accepting and understanding about others and and not thinking that they're the only ones that have done something great um and also we also when you look at massachusetts most of massachusetts are small towns and in many of those small towns are only caucasian people they haven't got a variety of different cultures so those a lot of their children they grow up through all the grades not seeing in person people of color unless they're on a sporting team you know that has to travel to compete uh or television what we see on television so even the media uh what we see on tv has to become more culturally showing accurately showing who the different cultures are they've done that with with uh p- people of color um I would love to see there is a new series I think a TV series that shows an Asian family but there's not enough of that to show our children that it's part of the fabric of our country. Right. But I I really thank, thank you for sharing your your stories it 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 just renews my uh determination to support you and to help in any way that I can um as as an educator and and working towards my goal is is to change the frameworks the the Massachusetts frameworks in a significant way um i'm not there yet but i mean i think eventually there will be it will it will get there right thank you jenny i think um a lot of us are doing the same thing you know over here for first for asians uh, asian americans um in the um, you know especially uh from the Chinese Historical Society of New England that Stephanie and I were involved in um also the Institute of Asian American Studies at UMass Boston that uh, Michael was involved in 
still involved in for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the Tufts University community partnerships that Shirley is involved in. Um, and the Bridgewater Asian Studies Program, Asian American Studies Program I, I started. So we all, all did our, our share to try to uh, engage with the community uh, based learning and make sure that our Asian American students and also the non-Asian American students know about the community and, and work together to study and, and understand each other. Um, I know that Michael's done a lot of research and Shirley has done a lot of activist uh, community-based work with her students. Um, are you optimistic for both of you about the progress you've made in your work? Or do you think that there's still a long way to go? There's still a no, gap I think understanding. It's um, a, I think it's a matter of getting on in the right places. Yeah. Um, right. You know, you have to get on the Board of Education. Right, right. Well, yeah. they are making some changes and I just want to let everyone know there's a fantastic series that's going on right now on Channel 2 on Asian Americans. And it's, it's bringing up exactly what Stephanie and Michael and them have said. And I've been watching it diligently because it just brings back so many. I can see some very similarities in the things that happened to them, which also happened to me as an African-American person uh, all through my life, you know. And, uh, you know, telling you to be quiet and, you know, don't speak out and all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, you know, the older I get, uh, the more and more I see uh, some of those ugly things remain. And it's going on from one generation to another. And it's very sad. Um, so I compliment everyone who wants to talk about that history because that Channel 2 one is fantastic. I don't know right. if anybody else saw it, but I've been Yeah, there's the five part documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. right. Awesome. right, Michael, you, you were going to say something. Well, I was just, I was just gonna say that, you know, I, I, I have met a lot of young people and I, I think as a whole, they seem to be much more accepting of uh, diversity and that's actually where that's my, um, you know, uh, source of optimism. Uh, I think it's it's, um, and I think like you know, education. It's true. I, you know, I mean, um, you know, like the Cavertian community, for example, has a very long history here, and and um, but I, I know that nothing's really been written about it, um, and. Every, you know, everybody has a story, but, uh, and the, if people knew the stories, but the, I think the problem is though, for, for, for those that are older is that, do they want, to, you know, the question I have is, do they really want to listen to the stories? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, you know, the people here, you know, I know, you know, you want to hear it, but, but there's, I think a large part of the population that they, the, you know, they don't want to know, for instance, that, that um, that Asians are not all uh, foreigners. They're not particularly interested in hearing that. So um, yeah, that's, that's that's really my question um, about whether I'm optimistic or not. But I, I do really do think that young people seem to be quite different in terms of how their friends and you know their views about you know the world. Mm -hmm. Every month, you know that in every month in Boston public schools is a focus on a different culture, and there is support uh, materials sent to teachers uh, to get them familiar enough to use it within their classrooms. At some, you know, they don't tell them when to teach it. I mean, w what time of the day? But the, you have four weeks um, set up in Boston public schools just for the to make sure that the whole city is focused on culture in some way. And I wish that model would be replicated throughout the cities um, here in Massachusetts and, and even in the suburbs because that's where everybody uh, is learning something. And that's the fastest and easiest way that I have found 
um, that I can I can share cultural information with students. Um, so I, I kind of did both and went a little, it was a little crazy managing it all, but that's how I initially started was okay. the music culture. Yeah, thank you. I think Vernon wants to speak and then Stephanie. I just wanted to ask a question of uh, Professor Liu there. I was intrigued by his mention just in passing of what happened and the creation of the medical centers in, in the area of South Boston. And if you could comment on that, many of us have been to that medical center and we see it as a good thing. Maybe it's not such a good thing. Did it cause a lot of harm to the community or not? Well, I, I think, Stephanie, do you want to, do you want to address that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I had a lot of dealings with um, New England Medical Center, and um, I know that uh, because I was working on the planning of the brand new Quincy School, and it was uh, the the city had invited Tufts University and Tufts Medical Center to help them with this planning, and it was supposed to be called a community school, but they did not invite anybody from the community to participate in this. So. Of course, I got involved in that as one of uh, my early um, projects. And working with the planning department at Tufts Medical Center, um, the planner told me that there was a time in the 70s when the, unit, when the medical center, when the hospital faced this issue because so many of the hospitals were, so many people were moving out to the suburbs. I mean, part of the reason why the whole expressway was built was because everybody had cars and they were all moving out into the suburbs. And so New England Medical Center faced a question, do we stay in the city or do we go and relocate out in the suburbs? And they made the decision to stay in the city. And in order to do that, they needed property and they needed parking. So they had a plan to take some property and build an 800 car garage. And that was, galvanizing event that the community said, no, you are not building 800 cars right smack dab in the middle of our residential area. And, you know, looking back, we actually saved the hospital from spending the money to do that um, because public transportation became much better and they have their own stop on the orange line that's called Tufts Medical Center. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was, that was a huge struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, and, the, and one of the reasons why they, um, they didn't have a lot of patients from Chinatown is because the local um, community health center had doctors, but they were not qualified or not given admitting privileges. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the admitting privilege, well, where do, I mean, if you're, you're seeing a doctor at the South Cove clinic and you need to go into the hospital, they're going to want to go to the Tufts Medical Center, but they didn't have, since the doctors didn't have admitting privileges, they couldn't send them there. So that was um, that was a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're all very proud. I mean, in this area, we're very all very proud of our you know hospitals and mm -hmm. and, and I think they do serve the population. But I, I think in you know the problem was like I mean you, you even look like uh, Mass General, right? It took over an area that was uh, was also a poor low income area before they you know redeveloped it, right? Uh, the West End. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's it's not that it's bad for <laughs> this, you know, the population as a whole. It's just like, you know, how you do it, you know, because I think in actuality, when these institutions were built, they took advantage of, of less powerful uh, populations, basically. Well, it's bad if it's not even serving the community. <laughs> right, right. right. The neighboring community. But it is now, is that they're, doing, they're doing a much better job and they do have, um, they do have a lot of programs that do target um, the community. <laughs> but, but, but I wonder how much of that is competition. I mean, the, the, the market, oh, yeah, right. you know, patient market has changed. They compete for patients now. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I have a question about gentrification. Uh, I worked for the D Department of Social Services or uh, Children and Families. And at one time we were on the waterfront and then we moved to Washington Street, right near the Chinatown station. So I worked there for a while in that office, our central office. And as you know, that's right there with 
at the at the edge of Chinatown. And then a, a lot of talk was then around um, people looking to buy up property in Chinatown, wealthy people, so that they could, you know, basically take over the area and build high rises and et cetera. So any word on what, what's going on with that? Is that happening? Because I know people were very concerned in the Chinese community there that they would just be um, bought out by, the, by wealthy developers and their places would just be taken over. We could take another hour to talk about this, but a short <laughs> version of answer, Michael. And oh, is there is it three minutes? <laughs> no, no, answer? we can we can okay. extend for five minutes, but let's let's talk about this a little bit. Yes. Well, I think the answer is yes. It is it's happened in a very drastic, you know, in a very drastic way. I mean, but fortunately, China, I mean, Chinatown has been able to build some low income. I mean, uh, uh, subsidized housing that I think will maintain the neighborhood. But for all the row houses that of the type that me and you know Stephanie grew up in, I think you know all that stuff is more or less gentrified. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, if Stephanie, you have. Well, I I, I think it's um, very hard to um, to fight against financial interests of big developers who want to build. I mean, they want to go where the money is or where they can make a lot of money. Um, and the community doesn't have the same kind of resources. So it's very difficult. We don't, you know, we just don't have either the financial resources or the developers or um, enough lawyers who don't need money to, you know, can do this on a pro bono basis to help us fight these efforts. But, you know, if, if, if it's, I, to me, it's, um, it's something that the city and the state need to decide. Is having a Chinatown something that is worthwhile to the state, to the city? And if so, then what are you going to do to help the community stay put? I mean, it's San Francisco faced the same issue after the 1906 earthquake. There were a lot of city fathers in San Francisco who said, oh, this is a good time. There were so many buildings destroyed. This is a good time to get rid of Chinatown. And people in Chinatown said, wait a minute. This is, um, you know, we own some of this property. And there are people in Los Angeles says, you don't want your Chinatown? We want the Chinatown. And so the city, San Francisco, turned it around and said, oh yeah, maybe it's a good idea to, you know, invest in, in Chinatown. And people within Chinatown said, okay, we're gonna make this a big tourist attraction. And it has, I mean, it's an icon of the city of San Francisco, right? I mean, when people think of San Francisco, they think of Golden Gate Bridge, they think of um, Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to add that I think though that Boston has, I mean, Boston Chinatown has fought a good fight. It has fought a good fight. Against gentrification. I mean, that's probably what you know, the book I wrote is about is that it has been able to, to survive, <laughs> to survive. So yes. Um, right. I think there are a lot of uh, good comments in the ch on the chat um, about community members sharing their uh, memories of growing up and their relationship to other Asian Americans in the community. And some of the folks were talking about their, you know, classmates or very few Asian families when they grew up, but they did uh, live in a multiracial, multicultural community and how Chinese Americans, Asian Americans were living in certain sectors of the parts of the town. And then there are also some other members talking about um, the, the red lining and gentrification in uh, Michigan that Janet grew up in uh, similar to Boston as well. Um, we got uh, folks talking about their, you know, um, classmates and friends, but there were very few of them. Um, so the suburban life is, definitely different that um, Shirley was able to um, grow up with the Chinese um, families that were there. And, you know, I, I feel like this is quite normal for uh, immigrants, whether you came from long time ago or from more recently, you try to maintain a balance between the sense of belonging you have uh, with other people who speak the same languages and have share the same cultures, but you also 
integrate in into the society with you know working with folks who are from other races and cultures um so i feel like this is a process of give and take um and maintaining the balance and but also fighting for the justice and equality and equity that we all try to maintain um so i don't know we passed a 7 30 already are there any other comments that I, I didn't summarize and some any one of you want to say some final conclusions. Do the speakers have anything to add as the final comments? I would like to say that I enjoyed the conversation and the thought that everybody had very, very much. And uh, I know I have a number of friends in the Chinatown Lions Club that have over the years worked very hard in their community and in our state to raise money for eye research and do things in the community. So. For those of you that spoke tonight, thank you very much for what you had to uh, offer the insight to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Noi. Thank you for having us. Shirley, you should say something because we. I think me and <laughs> I enjoyed. I enjoyed hearing everyone's stories, hearing about New Bedford, about multicultural education. There, everything is what I'm. It's all things I'm passionate about. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you everyone for attending this. Um, this is being recorded. So we, we hope to send you a recording of last recording of the first part one and this recording as part two. My hope is that the series that um, Emily has done for African-Americans and Asian-Americans and one series about Native Americans could all be collated together as educational resources for the community, for local school, school districts, or for Bridgewater State University for the future. So I think, I think the idea of ethnic community and social justice is really important for us to think about. And it's particularly interesting to think about our personal stories and histories. So thank you very much. I hope everyone happy, happy Asian American Heritage Month. And- <laughs> you win, Kai. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I know. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.